Good morning and welcome. I'm so glad that you are joining us in this time. Today is a day of celebration. We come together to celebrate all that God has given to us in and through Jesus Christ and all that God continues to do for us out of His great love. Today is October the 25th. Uh, we're continuing our series and study on the book of Daniel. And we're celebrating the observance of Reformation Sunday as well, when we remember how the Lord has saved us by His grace through faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. I'd like to take you right into our time and the place of worship as we gather in heart and mind and spirit in this moment with these words. Eternal God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be present with us in this time of worship. Receive our prayers and praises and let your glory shine on us your love surround us, your power fill us, your grace free us, and your spirit unite us. Amen. I have some words that I'd like to share with you that we might consider our Reformation Day Festival Creed. It's about who we are and what Christ has done for us. These words were recorded by the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther nearly 500 years ago. The heart of the teaching of the scriptures and of the Christian faith that we celebrate as we observe Reformation Sunday is this, I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord, who has redeemed me a lost and condemned person, purchased and won me from all sins from death and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy, precious blood and his innocent suffering and death, that I may be his own and live under him in his kingdom and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, just as he is risen from the dead, lives and reigns to all eternity, this is most certainly true. Amazing grace, how sweet sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. T'was grace that taught my heart.
Please join your hearts and minds with mine in this opening prayer. O Lord, you are mighty, our mighty fortress, our never-failing refuge, our helper amidst the troubles, whose word and promises are stronger than any earthly or evil power. We thank you that you have sent your Son to seek and to save the lost, and to redeem us and all from the consequences of our disobedience and disrespect for you and your will. You sent your Son Jesus to die on a cross, and in the place of every man and woman, taking into himself what every person deserves because of their sin, condemnation and hell and death. You count His sacrifice for us, and you declare we are completely forgiven. You also count your Son's perfectly lived life for us, as if we had lived it, and you prepare us thereby for heaven and entry into it. And Lord Jesus, we thank you, for as the one who conquered death and the grave you have promised all who put their trust and hope in you that you shall give to us your life-giving power, sharing it with us so that we overcome death and we also live forever in your glorious care and provision. Thank you for your amazing grace, your unfailing love, for making us your sons and daughters and for ruling over our lives with truth, justice, goodness, and compassion. Lead us and empower us by your Holy Spirit to love and serve you with grateful hearts for all you have done for us through Christ Jesus, our King of glory. Amen. This Reformation Day Scripture Declaration from the book of Ephesians. You were dead in your trespasses and sins, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with Him and seated he seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace we have been saved through faith, and this is not our own doing. It is the gift of God and not the result of works so that no one may boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand 
that we should walk in them. Hi there, I'm Mr. Yule, I'm back, and this time I have two new beautiful assistants. This is... Shayna. 
And this is? Alexis. That's right. And today we're going to tell you some stuff about a man named Job and what happened to him when God tested him. So Job was a really good guy. He had a great big family. He was, everyone thought he was wonderful and he loved God and God was very proud of him. But there came a tough time in Job's life and God tested Job so that we could see if Job was truly loved God because he loved God or did he just love God because God was good to him. And so lots of bad things happened to Job. And at the end of it, God came and talked to Job about what happened. And part of what God asked Job is, you questioned a lot what happened to you, Job, and you questioned me about was I being fair to you? Do you not trust me? Don't you know how much more I know about life and animals and everything around you than you do? And Job listened as God asked him questions, and Job realized, I don't know a lot compared to God. I don't know anything compared to God. So I have to be honest with you, there was one thing that Job knew that was truly amazing. What he knew that was truly amazing is he said, I don't care what happens to me. I know that my Redeemer, God, is there for me. When everything ends, I know that in the last day, I'll be standing before my God and he'll welcome me into heaven. So Job really was a very loving and kind man, and he knew and trusted God. But so what we're going to do is these girls have been drawing some pictures for me. And what they drew is a picture of what we call a flat man. A flat man lives in flat land. By the way, Shannon, did you name your man? What do you want to call your flat man? Flatty. Flatty. Okay, so we have Mr. Flatty. <laughs> and Alexis, did you name your flat person? Um, Flippy. Okay, so we're going to be looking at Mr. Flatty here because I only can show one picture at a time. And Mr. Flatland lives in Flatland, and he's sort of like us. And so there he is. There's the picture of Mr. Flatland. He's living in Flatland. Let me scoot this thing forward so you can see him a little bit better. There's Mr. Flatland, and we're going to turn him around so he's right side up to you. Now, right now, Mr. Flatland doesn't have any features, so we're going to give him a couple features. I think Mr. Flatland who lives in this piece of paper, he needs to have an eye. So we're gonna give him an eye. There's his eye, so he can see things. And do you think Mr. Flatland should have a heart? Sure. Yeah, sure. so we're gonna give him a nice heart here. There's his heart. And do you think Mr. Flatland can think of ideas and stuff? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we're gonna show him being really surprised. So that's an exclamation point. So he's surprised by something. He's probably surprised that he has his first idea. And so there's our Mr. Flatland, and he's living in the land of flat. That's Mr. Flatty in the land of flatland. He can't see us because he can only see what's ever in the piece of paper. So if we were to put something in the piece of paper, he could see that. But he can't see. He's like, wow, all of a sudden there's something in front of me. No idea where it came from because he can't see us. So, however, we can see Mr. Flat. So one of the things God tells us is that he is always with us. And he's really, really close to us. And we look around and say, I don't see him. So, Alexis, can you show me how close you can get to Mr. Flatland, but he still can't see you? Put your hand right on top of him. Yeah. Can he see you? No. He can only see what's in the paper. How close are you? You're really close. Matter of fact, you're so close, you're touching his heart. Well, God says he can touch our heart, but we, we don't see his hand reaching inside of us because we're sort of like that flat person. God has access to us that we're not aware of, but God says, I'm right next to you, and we look around, I don't see anybody, but God's right there with us. There's something else here. Shana, can you see the man's heart? Can you see Flatty's heart? Yeah. That's one of the things God says to us. I can see your heart. I can see what you're feeling. The other thing he says is, I know your thoughts. So what is Mr. Flatty's thought right now? I think I see a thought in his head. What is it? An exclamation point. Yeah. And he's like, how do you know what I'm thinking? Well, we can see what you're thinking. So to Mr. Flatty, we're sort of like God, aren't we? Yeah. Yeah, and so if Mr. Flatty was Job, he'd be going, how does he know so much? Well, I think maybe that's why God knows so much about us, is that he can actually see right into the center of us. He can see everything about us at the same time, just like we can see everything there is to see about Mr. Flatty. Well, Mr. Flatty wants to see God. So let's see, the only way I could get Mr. Flatty to see you, Shana, if you're his God, is we'd have to cut him out of that piece of paper. 
If we cut Mr. Flatty out of Flatland, do you think he'd survive? No, no. Matter of fact, one of the things the Bible tells us, no man can see God and survive. So in the body that you have right now, we'd have to cut you out of this universe so you could see God and you wouldn't be here anymore. <laughs> so to us, it looked like you weren't surviving. So we're quite a bit like Mr. Flatty. Well, I'll tell you what, how could we show Mr. Flatty, Shana? What could we do? Could we like poke a finger through the piece of paper? No, that would leave a hole. Well, what would he see if you poked your finger through the paper? He would see you, right? What would he see? My finger. What would he see? What would your finger look like to him? A hole. Well, or a circle, right? Mm -hmm. So there's Shana's finger sticking through the piece of paper. It just showed up as a circle. And now Mr. Flatty says, oh, I've seen Shana. She's a circle because she stuck her finger through there. But Shana knows, well, wait a minute. I'm more than just a circle. Well, really, what else are you? So you stick two more circles through there. And now, Mr. Flatty, what does he see? He sees three circles. And whatever that was, yeah. And a little cloud. Yeah, whatever that was. But that wasn't Shana. <laughs> so Shana now has three fingers sticking in Mr. Flatland's world, Mr. Flatty's world. And now he thinks, Shana's three circles. And Shana's going, I'm not three circles. I'm one girl. Well, for those of you who know a little bit about the Bible, mm -hmm. um, we say that God is three and God is one. And this is an example of how God can be three and God is one. We see three different circles, but he's the same God. So that could be the circle is the Father, the circle is Jesus, the circle is the Spirit. So those are examples of, I hope you learned a little bit about how much bigger God can be than us. Just like we're a lot bigger than Mr. Flatty, can God be bigger than you and me? Yes. You bet. All right, girls, you did a great job. Say goodbye. Bye. Our scripture reading for the day is the sixth chapter of the book of the prophet Daniel. We begin reading at verse 1. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be throughout the whole kingdom, and over them three presidents, of whom Daniel was one, to whom these satraps should give account, so that the king might suffer no loss. Then this Daniel became distinguished above all the other presidents and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Then the presidents and the satraps sought to find a ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom, but they could not find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful and no error or fault was found in him. Then these men said, We shall not find any ground for complaint against this Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. Then these presidents and satraps came by agreement to the king and said to him, O King Darius, live forever. All the presidents of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps, the counselors and the governors are agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an injunction that whoever makes petition to any god or man for thirty days except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Therefore, King Darius signed the document and injunction. When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. Then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and plea before his God. Then they came near and said before the king concerning the injunction, O king, did you not sign an injunction that anyone who makes petition to any god or man within thirty days except to you, O king, 
shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing stands fast according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be revoked. Then they answered and said before the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or the injunction you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. Then the king, when he heard these words, was much distressed and set his mind to deliver Daniel, and he labored till the sunset went down to rescue him. Then these men came by agreement to the king and said to the king, Know, O king, that it is the law of the Medes and Persians that no injunction or ordinance that the king establishes can be changed. Then the king commanded, and Daniel was brought and cast into the den of lions. The king declared to Daniel, May your God whom you serve continually deliver you. And a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den. And the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signal of his lords that nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. No diversions were brought to him and sleep fled from him. Then at day, at break of day, the king rose and went in haste to the den of lions. And he came near to the den where Daniel was. He cried out in a tone of anguish. The king declared to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lions' mouths, and they have not harmed me, because I was found blameless before him. And also before you, O king, I have done no harm. Then the king was exceedingly glad and commanded that Daniel be taken out of the den so Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no har kind of harm was found on him because he had trusted in his God. And the king commanded, and those men who had maliciously accused Daniel were brought and cast into the den of lions, they, their children, and their wives. And before they reached the bottom of the den, the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces. Then King Darius wrote to all the peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, Peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in all my royal dominion people are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed, and his dominion shall be to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. He who has saved Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius, and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Here ends the reading of the Holy Scripture. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God, and praise be to Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. fails me all my days I've been held in your hand from the moment that I wake up till I lay my head oh I will sing the goodness of 
Grace to you and peace. From God the Father and His Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We have all been in the lion's den. Oh, perhaps it wasn't as dangerous and life-threatening as it was for Daniel many years ago. But we have all been in the lion's den. It happened to me just a couple of weeks ago, and it happened to a number of you in the same way. It was that Monday night, and uh, it was the occasion of the recent glass fire. Like many of you, Mary and I got the order to evacuate our home because the fire was heading our way, racing through the hills and forests along the north side of Highway 12. The news reporters were telling us already that it was already, sadly, tragically, taking out some of the homes up in the Skyhawk neighborhood. And the fire was heading right towards the neighborhood where 
dozens of the families of this congregation live, including Mary and me. The air was thickening with smoke, and it was also thickening with tension, uh, with looming threat, and with concern and worry for others as well as for ourselves. We did what so many of you do when facing the threat of danger, dangerous fires in this case. You decide quickly what the few hardest to replace things are that you can throw into the back of your car and into the trunk, and then you try to get out of the way of the threat. You move quickly. Mary took her car and went one direction to evacuate. I was just a couple of minutes behind her, but I took the different direction to get out of the neighborhood because when I was making my escape, it seemed that the uh, street was more open and more clear. And it was uh, for about 300 yards until I got around the corner from my house. And there, gridlock. Thousands of us were trying to escape at the same time. So there I was, sitting in my car, out in front of Binkley Elementary School on Canyon Drive, and we were all gridlocked, not moving anywhere. We weren't moving even an inch at times. Five minutes ticked off the clock. It seemed forever. And then seven minutes. And by this time, it's already seemingly going to be a situation where we're just not going to get anywhere, that it's going to be gridlocked all through the night. And I was aware that there were thousands of folks coming from the east, from the area of Oakmont, down Highway 12 in the direction of my neighborhood, who were trying to evacuate their homes and neighborhoods, oh, starting a good hour before me and Mary. And they were gridlocked. They were stuck out in the street too. So how were we going to get through? All the while, I am looking out my side view mirror of my car, and I could see the flames of the fire at the top of the ridge, and the movement of the flames towards me and down that ridge seemed to be quickening with every minute, and it seemed at that moment unstoppable. And I had grave concern about all the families and all of our fellow church members who live in those neighborhoods east of Calistoga Road. But then, I have to admit, I started thinking, and I started getting a little bit angry at myself, you know, asking, why didn't I evacuate earlier? Why didn't I get out of the house earlier? Why didn't I go the same route that Mary took getting out of the neighborhood? She was ahead of me. She was already in safety. We were talking on the phone, and there I was stuck. And then I found myself planning my last ditch, desperate survival move. If the gridlock prevented me from getting out of this neighborhood, and then the fires continued to rage down the hillside and into the neighborhoods and take over the houses and kick up with even more steam and fury, well, my best bet was to get off the street, bust through the fence of Binkley School, get out there in the open area of the school's large play yard, drive to the far west end of the lot, let all the flames burn through the open field area, and then drive my car, speed it through the burning grass to the section of the schoolyard where things had already been burnt. Pretty good, huh? If you are wondering how my faith was holding up or helping out at this moment or how God was speaking to me at this moment, I will tell you that on the one hand, he was saying, don't worry, I'm going to get you and all of you out of the way and to safety. And then on the other hand, there I was, formulating my best last-ditch effort to survive if, in fact, I had to do it to get out of my neighborhood and get through this Daniel Lion's Den experience. But I did think to myself that if I did survive having to use this 
last-ditch effort that it would be with the help of God that I would be protected and cared for and spared. A funny thought went through my thinking because of the sermon series that we are in and because of our study of the book of Daniel. I actually thought to myself at one point in the middle of all this that's going on, what if Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were in the back seat of my car? What would they do? What would they say? They'd probably say, hey, Jim, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us. But if not, be it known to you and to all that we will not give up worshiping and trusting in our God. And I have to admit that I went on to think, huh, I kind of wish that maybe it were Moses who was with me in the back seat because maybe he could just part the flames and let all of us drive through to the other side of town on safe ground. The lion's dens are those places which present circumstances that are threatening. They cause us to pause and to wonder if we're going to make it through. We, we start measuring what is at stake and what we might lose in this lion's den experience and what it's all going to cost us. It can be a place of pain, by the way. It can be a place of great loss. It can be a place of ill health. Often the circumstances which constitute our lion's dens are outside of our control. The lion's den is a place where it's easy to become tense and nervous, and worrisome, and fearful, and anxious, or greatly troubled in heart and mind. Sometimes we find ourselves becoming like Darius um, in that account from Daniel chapter 6 where we hear that he worried about someone else. He worried about Daniel who was in the lion's den and he couldn't eat and he was greatly distressed and he couldn't sleep and he didn't want anybody breaking in on his grave concern and thoughts for Daniel. He wanted no interruptions. Many of you have faced far greater, more threatening lion's dens than I did the night of September the 28th. And not just because of the fires that have swept through our county over the last three years. Many of you know that uh, one of my three brothers had a spot of cancer on his esophagus. My nephew's wife was stricken with lung and brain cancer at the age of 25. Another of my brothers lost his capacity to serve as a pastor in ministry because of debilitating depression. My father suffered two aphasic strokes and a heart attack in the last 12 years of his life. My father-in-law was stricken with stage 4 intestinal cancer at the same age Mary and I are at right now. My older cousin Marilyn, earlier this year, battled the coronavirus and the resulting complications for five months. Another cousin was stricken with lymphoma. My favorite aunt was thrown into the lion's den when she was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. One of my cousins lost his job, lost his family and all of his relationships, lost his residence, and was homeless and out on the streets because of an addiction from which he could not break himself free. We all face the lion's den. But the story of Daniel in his lion's den, can help me and can help you and us when we face our little or our very large lion's dens. God tells us 
that He will be with us during the threatening time. Do you remember how this was said in our chapter 6 from Daniel? At verse 22, we have Daniel answering the question that King Darius asked him the morning after Daniel had been thrown into the lion's den. The king came running down to find out if Daniel was still alive, and he shouted down to Daniel, Are you still alive, Daniel? Has your God delivered you from the lions? And Daniel replied, My God sent his angel and shut the lions' mouths, and they have not harmed me. More than a hundred years before Daniel, and maybe 150 years or so before this time of Daniel in the lion's den, there lived another prophet whose name was Isaiah. And he wrote these words, words that come from the very heart and mind and mouth of our awesome living God. And he speaks them to his dearly loved children whom he has chosen who he has made his own and made part of the church back in that day. And he said to them, So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. All who rage against you will surely be ashamed and disgraced. Those who oppose you will be as nothing and perish. Though you search for your enemies, you will not find them. Those who wage war against you will be as nothing at all. For I am the Lord your God, who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, do not fear, I will help you. You know, Daniel no doubt had heard the words of Isaiah many times. Maybe he had even committed them to memory. I mean, after all, he was a student of the Scriptures, and God's Word guided his path through life and gave him an unwavering faith in God. King Darius was spot on when he said, The God of Daniel is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed, and His dominion shall be to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in the heaven and on the earth. He who has saved Daniel from the power of the lion. You know, sometimes when we are in the lion's den, God sends His angel to protect us. Sometimes He sends a thousand firefighters to the top of the ridge out in Rincon Valley to hold their ground against the fire and to halt the progress of that fire, delivering almost all of the homes of the neighborhoods. Sometimes he sends a vaccine, a remedy, a surgery, a medical treatment. Sometimes he heals a broken marriage with peace and love, or a damaged relationship, rekindling friendships. Sometimes he gives a new job and a new job opportunity with a new company. It's a different place, but it's something brand new. And He delivers us, and He saves us. Sometimes He delivers us and rescues us by taking us home to heaven. And other times, He delivers us from the lion's den by giving us grace and strength so that we can endure through the time of the trial with our faith and our hope for a better tomorrow still intact. In Deuteronomy chapter 4 at verse 31, we read these words. The Lord your God is a merciful God. 
He will not abandon you, destroy you, or forget the promise to your ancestors that he swore he would keep. That night in the car when I was in my little lion's den, I asked myself, so what if I don't make it out of this predicament? Now for a moment, I have to admit to you, uh, the thought about uh, not making it out of the looming fires and the, the lion's den that I was in in that moment, it kind of disappointed me. I was kind of bummed, you know. I was thinking to myself that, man, I have a lot more good years uh, for doing what God wants me to do, uh, for loving my wife and my children and my family, uh, sharing joys with friendships and through friends, that he's given me decent health, and maybe for many more years I could continue to serve him to the best of my abilities. And so I was kind of bummed to think that maybe that could come to an end. But I'm also keeping in mind my last-ditch effort of crashing through that fence at the school and making it through the flames with the help of God so that I would be delivered and I could give testimony to the greatness of God and how he saves. But I also recognize that his better plan for me is, in fact, better no matter what it is. His perfect plan for me might be something different than I thought would come all along, or maybe which I even preferred. But as long as it is his plan, I know that I can remain safe in his care no matter what, because that's his good will and purpose for me, and he will never abandon me. I even know that because he's given me faith in him and in his son Jesus Christ, and that I am therefore his chosen, forgiven, sanctified, made right, redeemed child through Jesus Christ and what he has done, that heaven is my home. And the day that I get there will be the best day of my existence. So my dear friends, when you face your lion's den, remember the words of Isaiah. Words that perhaps were in the mind of Daniel when he was in his lion's den. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Those who wage war against you will be as nothing at all, for I am the Lord your God. Proclaim His glory. Rest secure in His care, for He is your awesome God who rescues and who delivers. In the name of Jesus, amen. And may his peace and his love, which is beyond our ability to fully comprehend, nonetheless keep our hearts and minds in faith in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting, amen. You know, if we were together here in the sanctuary of St. Mark Lutheran Church like uh, we used to be so regularly and frequently before we had to kind of stay away and apart from one another, at least for the time being. Uh, we would take opportunity to allow you to worship the Lord by giving your gifts and offering your tithes and your treasures to Him. We cannot pass the plates, of course. Uh, we're connecting with one another online, virtually. But I want to let you know uh, how appreciative we all are that you continue to so generously support the work of this congregation, as we share love with one another in this community of faith, as we encourage and build one another up, and as we share God's love and redemption in Jesus Christ with the people in our neighborhood and in the community and the world around us. We're doing a wonderful thing here. It's really not us. It's Jesus at work in us and through us and out into the community. And we're just joining him in getting done what he wants done in the world. So thank you for your offerings. You can continue to uh, send them in by way of mail or drop them off in the church office 
or certainly you can tap into our online giving program, uh, which the information has been shown to you or is being shown to you now. May God continue to bless us as we go about sharing His redemptive and restorative love with all people. To God be the glory, great things He does. Lord, thank you for this day of prayer where we can freely lift our voices to you and lift our nation to you, our government, our leaders. You are our God. We've gone through many challenges as a country, but our history is rich with triumph. Generation after generation have gone to their knees to pray, to overcome. You are our God. We know you hear our prayers. Our country was founded with trust in you, and we still trust in you, in the midst of uncertainty, through all things. Together, we raise our hands and our voices in prayer for our nation, declaring you are our God. Amen. Let us now pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all according to their need. Abba, Father, almighty and everlasting God, the giver of every good gift, who meets all of our needs just at the right time, who watches over and cares for us day by day, we acknowledge you to be our great and awesome God, whose mercies to us are new every morning. We do thank you and praise you that you've made us your own dear children through the redemption that is ours in and through your Son, Jesus Christ. You invite us to come to you as Abba and to make our needs and petitions known to you. And therefore we pray, watch over those and protect them who keep watch over us and who keep us safe and who minister to our health. Use them as instruments of your healing in our lives and the lives of all people in our world everywhere. Give insight and discovery to those who are developing tests to diagnose the coronavirus and vaccines to prevent it and treatments to knock it down and thwart it and protocols that will help eliminate this disease and its spread. Extend your healing to all who are sick. Relieve the pain and distress of those who suffer. Console those who mourn and comfort those who have suffered loss. Be a companion to the lonely and to the isolated. Bless and defend us against all evil and from the powers of this broken world, from famine and earthquake and violence and terrorism and unrest and injustice and racism and cruelty and fill us as the citizens of this land with Christ-like love for all people. Grant us government and executives and legislatures and justices that 
will serve for the respect and welfare of all people and leaders who will heed and do your word. Move us in the zeal of the Holy Spirit to proclaim the greatness of you and your love and your salvation that is for all people everywhere in Jesus Christ. And that through the witness of our words and the actions of our love in the name of Jesus, that many more may be caught up in the net of his saving work. We pray that you will also give food to the hungry and shelter to the homeless and supply to those who are in need. And that you will use us as instruments of your kindness in the world today, sharing a little bit of what you've given to us with those who are in need. And finally, Lord, keep us steadfast in your divine care. Keep us confident and trusting wholly in you as our good shepherd, so that we are never found lacking or wanting. And come and bless us with all that we need to sustain our lives as we would continue to serve you to your praise and glory to the best of our abilities. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Into your hands we commend all these for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now according to his promise, and as he has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Receive now this blessing. God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. God showed how much He loved us by sending His only Son into the world so that we might have eternal life through Him. Dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love one another. Therefore, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.
life bring suffering. Lord, I will remember what Calvary has bought for me.